On the 11th of January the same year, General Romeo Dallaire had sent a message to his boss in New York, General Barril, in which he was showing the existence of Inher Hamwe, trained and armed to the teeth, capable, according to one of these militias, of killing a thousand Tutsis in 20 minutes. He was also pointing out the existence of caches of weapons and was asking for authorization to seize them. The answer to that request had been total refusal from General Barril. Radio Rwanda and mostly Radio Libre de Mirkolin, RTLM, are fiercely calling for the extermination of cockroaches, here meaning the Tutsi, and to fill the tombs. RTLM pushes for the generalization of the killing in provinces and accompanies every step of genocide with murder incitement. The military kill with the gun and the bayonet, while the militia generally kill with machetes, clubs and bludgeons, with the exception of large groups. The killers sometimes go as far as cutting the fingers, the hands, the arms, and the legs before cutting the head and crushing the skull. They dismiss whole families, grandparents, parents, and children. Nobody escapes, not even newly born babies. The killers attack parishes and especially churches that used to be a place of refuge for Tutsi. This time, they have become the scene of the Holocaust. They even search caches in attics and nooks of old houses. They invade the woods and the forests and set them ablaze to ensure that no survivor is left behind. The killers inflict terrible suffering, both psychological and physical, by forcing parents to chop the heads of their children with pestles and by raping some in the eyes of the others. This unprecedented carnage is perpetrated by the death squadrons outside any fighting. To accelerate the operation, the victims themselves are asked to participate. They dig their own graves, long ditches they stand for whole families. In this country that is transformed into a real abattoir, the armed opposition of the Rwandese Patriotic Front is the only obstacle to the barbarity. The peacekeeping forces of the UNAMI let the murderers do whatever they wish without any reaction. The assassination of the Belgian peacekeeping troops quickly provoked the effects that the organizers were expecting from the international body. Instead of strengthening, the United Nations is in headlong flight. It is only a day after the assassination of the Belgian paratroopers that the withdrawal of the Belgian contingent of the UNAMIR starts. This will later lead to the total departure of the UNAMIR. On April 11th, at the official technical school in Kigali, where more than 2,000 people have taken refuge, are stationed some 90 Belgian soldiers of the UNAMIR. That afternoon, when Brussels orders its peacekeepers to leave the country, they leave the school. A few hours later, most of the 2,000 refugees are killed after the departure of the so-called peacekeepers. The United Nations seems to be more helpless than ever. On 8th of April, while the massacre is raging in the Rwandan capital, the UN Security Council has only one concern. How do we evacuate the UN staff and the foreigners? On 21st of April, the UN Security Council decides to reduce the peacekeeping force from 2,400 to 300, a clear indication that that genocide was the least of their concerns. By doing that, the UN gives the killers green light to carry out the genocide. The United Nations then tries laboriously to launch a UNAMIL II, composed mainly of African troops, but due to lack of commitment and unwillingness of its giant members, the deployment of these forces is turned down in full genocide. France refuses to support this new UN mission to Rwanda so that it may be able to intervene alone. The United Nations withdraws its forces so as to give way to the French intervention, Operation Turquoise, whose major objective was to stop the advance of the Rwandese Patriotic Army and come to the rescue of the genocide organizers by creating a safe haven for their transit. On June 22, 1994, the UN Security Council decided to support the French intervention proposal whose mandate was drafted by France itself. In this proposal, France anticipates neither effective stopping of the massacre 
nor the arrestation of the perpetrators of genocide. There is an important element of the 1929 resolution. Instead of using the term genocide, they use humanitarian crisis. The United States that had adopted and strengthened and interventionist tendencies saluted the Operation Turquoise with a sigh of relief and indifference. In mid-July 1994, the UN asks France to disarm the government soldiers that took refuge in the Turquoise zone. France replies that it has neither the means nor the people to do that. Between April and July 1994, the Organization of African Unity, as well as the United Nations, are not able to call genocide by its name and refuse to take sides between the genociders and the Rwandese Patriotic Front. In full genocide, in June, at the OAE summit, the government of the genociders is welcomed as the official representatives of Rwanda. Between April and July, the provincial and communal administrators, the military and the militia, carry out a genocide and kill as many people as the Khmer Rouge killed in four years. Narama Church is a branch of Nyamata Parish in Bujisera area of Chigari Ruro. This area has a reputation as a Tutsi stronghold. This church was the scene of the killing of more than 5,000 people. The killers of these people had been brought from Gisenyi and Rohenyeri and resettled in Bujesera with the gruesome plan of using them as death squadrons when the time came. At Kiveho and Ijikongoro province, the killing was settled from the hospital, guided by a physician. Then they attacked Kiveho College, where 82 students were killed. The primary school and the parish that accommodated refugees were also attacked. The church at Kiveho, famous across Rwanda for its revelations, was set on fire when it was still sheltering wounded people and some survivors of previous attacks. The people who perished at Kiveho are estimated at 24,000. Murambi, also in Ijikongo province, is a real symbol of human cruelty. The majority of the victims of the pogrom in this region were children. The number of victims at Murambi is about 50,000. At the National University of Rwanda in Butari province, considered as the source of intellectuals for the country, the deans and other professors made lists of their colleagues that had to be eliminated. 87 university professors will thus be killed. At the university hospital, 170 wounded people and other patients are strangled in their beds. At Nyaroboye in Chibongo province, 4,000 people were killed in the church and in the neighboring school. The residents of Kigali that were abandoned by the Belgian peacekeeping troops at a call technique officiel of Kichichiro, estimated at 2,000, were led to Nyanza Hill and killed in cold blood. The mountain of Bisesero on the border between Kibuye and Yikongoro has come to symbolize many aspects of the 1994 genocide. For more than 50,000 people who lost their lives there, it became the mountain of death. But Bisesero is also a symbol of resistance to the genocide. The 50,000 Tutsi who perished there put up an extraordinary fight. Though nearly wiped out, they continued to fight until early July. It is on that hill I'm showing you that we had camped. The resistance had camped on top of the hill to defend the weak. That means that the old men and women and children were on the other side of the hill behind us. When the killers attacked us, we would move down and retaliate. Some would die and others would survive. When they noticed that we had camped on that hill, they surrounded us. That is when we decided to pose a real resistance. We were using stones and traditional weapons such as machetes and other objects in our possession. 
We lost a number of old people that could not defend themselves as well as our wives and our children. We were left like this. We were surrounded on this hill and killed for 90 days. Three whole months. We did not accept to be killed just like that. At first, we tried to defend ourselves using the traditional weapons we had been left with, the rest having been taken away from us by Alois Ndibati, the administrator of Gisovu Komin. We had machetes, we had stones, we tried to defend ourselves, but considering the forces that were attacking us, we ended up being almost completely wiped out. The Rwandan genocide was not fate. As much as it was prepared, it could have been stopped as well during the first days of killing, given that precursor signs had been announced on the international level. Genocide, the worst of crimes, crime against humanity, simply required an international armed intervention. Only a counterbalance armed force to destroy the death machine. The overall number of victims of the Rwandan genocide is estimated at about one million, that is three quarters of the Tutsi population at that time. The International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda should perhaps one day, after having judged the masterminds, and the perpetrators of genocide also think of the responsibility of those who abandoned Rwandans to these demons. Genocide? Never again in the history of mankind. Never again. Never again.